Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 17th episode of Movies About Music. We have a special guest, Gordon Basali Jr., to discuss the film Round Midnight. I just want to mention before that this is my first time for this pod trying to engineer a remote recording. And unfortunately, I've learned what not to do next time. So there's some problems with levels, particularly CC's mic signal is too low. I just hope it's not too distracting and I wanted you to be aware of that. Also, I'll just take the opportunity, I know you hear this often, but reviews are really important to gaining some notice among the podcast platforms and the algorithms that kind of promote things. So we would love it if you could write up a review for us. That would really help us. And with that, here's our talk with Gordon. Welcome to Movies About Music. Yeah. With a special guest, Gordon Basali Jr. Welcome, Gordon. Welcome. Nice to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, guys. So, Gordon is a friend of ours, and he is a musician and a composer mm. and a performer. I know Gordon, I met Gordon primarily because of his exceptional trumpet playing. Oh, my. So I, I, um, I, actually, I'm not quite sure how I met you. You were playing with Cuttlefish, where you were playing guitar, <laughs> and you were playing with One Drop Beast playing trumpet, and yeah. you were also playing at, what was the name of that jazz, uh, uh, what was the jazz Monk. club? Monk. Yeah, Monk. That's right. And I would come see you play at Monk, too. So you were yeah, doing jazz and punk and <laughs> reggae. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's all over the place. Gordon is also a um, songwriter and composer, and uh, he's on Bandcamp. He has his own project called Damn Sight, which is that um, still actually, going on or is that not going no, on? Uh, I dropped that, the, okay. the Damn Sight mm. moniker. So it just didn't seem to fit what I was doing anymore. I mean, when I was doing more rock stuff, it made sense mm. to have that yeah. go slick name right but uh um, right. now it's just you know, it's more it's i guess it's closer to i guess classical now like kind of contemporary. yeah yeah because the dam site music was kind of experimental right. rock and it can you still can we still find your dam site music oh, sure. or has it all been ported over to gordon's no name? it's um I, I kept those albums on you know band camp okay. in it, but it'll be in my discography ah mm -hmm. that's confusing okay <laughs> Don't change your name. <laughs> a right. lot of artists do that, though. Yeah, I mean, how do many they? times did Prince change his name? <laughs> artists, especially nowadays, do that because they have different musical sort of personas, I guess. Yeah, um, hats a lot of people they do wear. different, yeah, genres. Play different instruments. They have different roles in different projects, and I think that's something that, yeah, I don't think it's confusing. That's very true. Gordon, you released something new this past mm. week that we downloaded mm, yeah, two, last night two days yeah. ago yeah 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 Can you tell us something about that yeah it's um kind of a return to the way i used to compose when i was first getting into it when i first realized that i wanted to be a composer and i've never stopped but this is more you know you know how composers you write for whatever is available whatever instrumentation is available mm. and if you're around punk musicians you write you know you join a punk band and whatever is there right mm -hmm. when i was in college it was you know there was an orchestra and wind ensemble and jazz band and everything mm -hmm. so you could just you you had musicians available to do whatever you wanted to do you know so I recently picked up some orchestral samples. Oh, and, those uh, were samples. Yeah, those were samples. They were Are they samples you know, that you performed? Because you're playing piano on this, and I'd never heard you play piano. Yeah, I performed them, yeah. So you performed everything, so it's just the samples you gathered. Right. It's kind of like synth patches, but it's triggering mm. thousands of these little tiny, you know, each note has its own sample and they recorded them at each individual note for each instrument multiple times, depending on, you know, wind speed and, you know, all, all sorts of things. It's uh, it's really complicated and I'm, I'm learning how to use these now. And it's quite, um, a lot of film and TV music is done this way. Mm -hmm. uh, they call them mock-ups. You want to present something 
before it actually goes into the the scoring stage, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you reminded me that you and I worked on a movie together. We worked on the yeah, documentary, and I asked you to do string arrangements, and yeah. and you did, and you did a beautiful job. You we worked with uh, I worked with a composer Violet Leah, and yeah. you did the string arrangements to her compositions, and it sort of made me think back to that kind of a, a almost. Um, at times, I mean, it's a very rich sound, your new album, but it's also kind of a minimalist movement that's going mm. on in the music, but sounding very orchestral, very cinematic in, in what you're doing that made me think of that experience. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's kind of the only film credit I have right now. Right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and that well, was 10 years ago. <laughs> people should listen to this album and and buy this album on Bandcamp. If you're looking for someone to do very interesting music, it's really cinematic. It's very cinematic and very colorful. I really like it. I listened to it twice today. Oh, wow. Thank really you. really like it. And we're also, what movie did we see, Cece? Uh, Round Midnight. Yeah. Um, 1986. You know, because you have a jazz background. Cece has a jazz background. I have a, I'm a pretend jazz person. I'm a pretend jazz person too, actually. But you actually sing jazz. I mean, I've sung in jazz bands you guys, and I don't know why I did that. You guys, you don't. <laughs> All right. How I you, did get, that. you guys can hold a lot of weight <laughs> in a jazz gig. Yeah, so we saw this movie. It stars Dexter Gordon, who is a legend in jazz. Do you want to talk about Dexter Gordon a little bit? Yeah, D- Dexter Gordon is he's a tenor sax player. It was. And I'm a trumpet player, but I love listening to Dexter Gordon. I don't listen to a ton of trumpet players to get inspired. I listen I love listening to sax players and guitarists and pianists and stuff. And Dexter Gordon is these days my go-to for listening. I just love mm-hmm. everything about his sound and his phrasing is really patient and thoughtful and mm-hmm. uh, just he always has something interesting to say in his solos and he's just such a laid back cool player. Oh, and, I agree but with really that, yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's very behind the beat, kind of a slow, yeah. almost like a slow player, if that's fair. He he can be. And then some other recordings of his, he's just rapid fire, great ideas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just really fast. Because he, he has like a fast. bebop era, right? Like he was yeah. really in the, the bebop scene. That's how that's the Dexter Gordon that I knew, mm. that I mm. listened to. So when I saw this movie, I was like, wait, what? Yeah, I know him through the ballads. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's starring him, and it's based on Lester Young and Bud Powell. Right. I mean, I know Lester Young as a icon of sort of the the pre Charlie Parker, right? Right. Bubba. He's one of those big band tenor soloists, right? Yeah. Well, I know for me, you know, because I I like singers. Um, Lester Young had a very intense relate. Uh, friendship with billy holiday oh that's right connection with lester yeah. young um i think he was in the army like he fought one of the wars at some point i forgot what uh, this is based on one book that i read by the way mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah there there was like a kind of like pi- a lot of saxophone players talk about lester young and how influential he was yeah and I know, like, you know, I know his recordings with Billie Holiday, mm-hmm, but that's mm-hmm. the extent of my knowledge with of um, Lester Young. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she gave him the Prez nickname. Oh, yeah, that's right. Prez. Uh, so thinking about the movie then, um, mm. do you know any background on this on this film? Because I didn't really have any background on it before we went into it. Yeah. I do know a little bit of, about the parallels between the movie and Bud Powell's life. And oh, I think okay. it, the story is more like Bud Powell's life in that Bud mm. Powell went to Paris and and he was really, he had a drinking and drug problem oh. throughout his adult life. And he was kind of one of those jazz casualties of addiction that we see mm-hmm. so many, the list is so long, you know, right. of mm-hmm. those, you know, Charlie Parker and John mm-hmm. Coltrane, you know, just huge list of terrible, horrible stories, you know, these people's mm-hmm. lives. And yeah, Bud Powell was one of those. And, you know, he ended up, I think, in a mental hospital. Mm. You know, there was even a character uh, in his life when they were in Paris, when he was in Paris, uh, oh. uh, mm-hmm. of a woman named nicknamed Buttercup. Okay, because oh. Butter Buttercup is movie? in the movie. Yeah. Is in the movie. But there was yeah. a Buttercup in his life in Paris who okay. was handling his finances and yeah. Didn't, you know, seeing after him and stuff. Right. Mm. So, yeah, what happens in the movie is he's, I think he comes to Paris in order to get some gigs. He has 
addiction problems like you're talking about. And we learn through the course of the movie, I mean, in the early kind of setup of the movie, that he needs people to handle his situation because so that he doesn't fall off the wagon. So he's not right. getting his pay directly. And there's someone, Buttercup, you know, kind of taking care of him. And then this French man mm -hmm. who doesn't have a lot of money, he lives alone with his daughter. He's separated from his wife. And he is just passionate about jazz music. Mm -hmm. He knows Dale Turner's music and he thinks of it as a genius. And he wants to kind of get his life together so that he can mm -hmm. keep doing music and keep doing his art. So it kind of takes on from there this kind of relationship between the two of them. Like early on in the film, it's such a slow kind of... <laughs> well, why are you laughing? <laughs> because I, I thought of what I said in the beginning of yeah. the movie. I was like, oh my God, I never would have voluntarily watched this movie. And then Jim <laughs> asked me why. And I said, well, it's because there are so many things that I'm so sick of in this movie. Like, I, I'm, I'm not interested in the plight of the jazz musician in Paris in the 1950s. I know too much about it. And then the droning jazz ballads with the sa the five chorus jazz saxophone solos. I'm not really interested in. Mm -hmm. And mm. this whole tragic jazz musician story I'm so sick of. But then I warmed up to the movie. But in the very first 20 minutes of the movie, I was like, oh no, what did we get ourselves into? Yeah, I think in the beginning, he was. we're supposed to understand that he's he's moved there to kind of rehabilitate himself to get yeah. out of New mm -hmm. York. And, mm -hmm. and so he does start off pretty kind of slow witted, you mm -hmm. know, slow minded, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and he kind of, as he later on, you know, he progresses it. He kind of, he promises to get off, get off mm -hmm. the stuff and behave. And, and then he does clean up and then his career mm -hmm. gets better and his playing improves two thirds of the way through, but it takes so long to get to that point. It, it does. It takes a long time to get to that point. It's true. And you do see the change in the character. It's worth noting. I think that he was yeah. nominated for an Academy Award yeah. for this yeah. role. Yeah. And it's a weird, it's a weird, it's kind of a weird performance, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. in the beginning, I thought it was just bad acting. Yeah, but yeah. then it Me just too. changed. I thought so too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you kind of have to warm up to it. It's, it's like, like oh, oh, this is who this, this character is. Gonna is. Be hard. This is going to yeah. be rough. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're going to have to watch him kind of learn how to act. And, you know. Yeah. But the thought that I oh, had, you know, so good by the end. He, yeah, was, yeah, he was. He was. The thought that I had is some like us warming up to the character. I think is sometimes how you are with musicians, like. Definitely. The really eccentric musicians you meet, if there's a pause in the conversation, you're like, is this guy here? Like, is he aware that we're having a conversation? You know, it, yeah. but then as you spend more time with a person like this, you come to be okay with their idiosyncrasies. Mm, totally. And there's a purity to the personality in a strange sense. So, yeah, that was, that's from that point of view, definitely. It's kind yeah. of like you're getting to know somebody new and you're getting used to their Right. I don't know if it was the directing or something. Yeah, and there was a strange uh, speech pattern thing that was, I think it turned out to be like somewhat intentional, I guess, because it got kind of better. Like he was well, he got more better alert. Too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think in the very beginning, I was kind of worried that we might have to put up with this really <laughs> for two yeah. out for more than two hours. Mm -hmm. I thought we would have to deal with the slow pacing of the music was very slow too. Yeah. Well, the um, also like just about the the jazz cliche thing that you're talking yeah. about. I think so. This is '86. I think this has been a fairly influential film, and I wonder if this is one of the ones that developed the cliches. So maybe this wasn't you know kind of a cliched thing at the time, but now that we see it now, we're like, you know, the the guy sitting in the in the alley next to the dumpster playing the saxophone. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's been parodied by The Simpsons and. Things like this that came later, but it's so it's strange kind of to see these things with our eyes. Was this be, this was before Bird, right? Yeah, Clint yeah. Eastwood's I think Bird. So. You guys probably you probably said this before in a previous podcast, but doesn't does it drive you nuts when it, it's a it's a movie about musicians, but it's clear that they can't play their instruments mm -hmm. or they're not mm -hmm. yeah. actually singing? You can probably oh, it tell crazy, that, yeah. right? Yeah, it drives yeah. you nuts, right? Because you're like, oh, but this movie gets around it in the best way. Yes, obviously. Hired, yeah. Oh my they hired god, actual mu they, yeah. famous uh, musicians. I mean, for this. yes. <laughs> we talked about this a couple of times because we've seen some movies where the performance mm -hmm. on the screen does not match what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. And I think the general I wonder, I don't know, but does the general public like know? I have That's had conversations with people who had no idea 
like it was a Korean show and there was a guy playing miming a saxophone, but the sound was a trumpet. And I was like, oh, no, that that's not even no. the right instrument. You know, this, uh, this happens notice. several times. Like this actually happens in a very famous music video too, a K-pop music video. And nobody but me noticed. <laughs> and I was, it was, it's very infuriating. And there was also like a, a girl who was holding the bass really wrong like it was clearly like there was nobody in this oh, world yeah. would ever hold a bass like that and she was strumming the bass like she, <laughs> like a guitar <laughs> so that would be the extreme yeah. version so even <laughs> during in extreme circumstances such as these people don't really pay attention hmm. and they don't really notice but then people like us who love music we yeah. like, we're scrutinizing it and i was like i don't know who the singer was the woman who was singing with him who was so this girl comes, she, she's she got a past relationship with him. Mm-hmm. I guess you were saying she's... Yeah, she's apparently a Broadway singer. A Broadway singer. Oh, she was really okay. good. She was only on briefly, but you watch that mm-hmm. and you see them playing together. Yeah, she definitely knows what she's doing. But it couldn't have been like, they're performing this on stage. What yeah. we're hearing, yeah. they're performing yeah. on stage. Right, and yeah. it's evident before that in the instrumental pieces. Yep. And it's almost like you're in that club mm-hmm. yeah you know that's what i love i think i love most about it i mean even if you remove the story it's some mm-hmm. really great performances that we're yeah. watching yeah. yeah with you know beautiful shots and how about that one or near the beginning where mm-hmm. it's when he sets up and he starts playing for the first time and he's right up close to his face and then mm-hmm. the camera just pulls back and you just kind of you're in the club and then mm-hmm. you're walking yeah. to the bar and then totally. you see that, you know, to catch this conversation, it's this perfect one you know? Yeah, it's all dolly shots. Everything. It's not zooms. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, you're moving through the space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I loved that. Yeah. That had me at that shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder like if, you know, like uh, for jazz sessions, you know, they'll do like take one and then take two and then take three. And sometimes they'll have all yeah. the takes on there, mm-hmm. you know, especially in the, I guess the CD era you know they'd have the multiple takes i wonder if they did that with the shot i mean what you can do with with film is you can separate out the the visual take from the audio take right and then you can kind of compile things together so either it was great performances or great picture editing Mm. or both i I would i my bet is on great performances yeah i i I want to i just want to think that that's the situation yeah and that it probably is i mean you've got herbie hancock you've got so let's go through the different bands. There was the Paris band with Herbie Hancock. There's Wayne Shorter, Cedar Walton. C- Cedar Walton was New York, I was, think. Was he in? Was he in New York? Yeah, because uh, okay. uh, Herbie Hancock was Paris. Yeah, he was in All Paris right. and Lyon. So there's three. Yeah, there's yeah. there's Paris, Lyon, and New York. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. And then Leon was, that was Tony. Was that Tony Williams? No. No, New York was Tony R- Williams and Ron Carter. Ron Carter. And Leon was like an extension. Is that where they Paris recorded band. it? Yeah. yeah. Is that where they did their res recording session? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they had Wayne Shorter. They Wayne had Shorter. Wayne Shorter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you see Freddie Hubbard in New York. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Who was my favorite. <laughs> Freddie, Freddie Hubbard. <laughs> I, we were commenting while we were watching. He was just. That guy, it's like his trumpet is his right hand. It's like an it extension was, yeah. of his body. He was playing some really high notes towards the end. Like he was doubling Dexter Gordon. Yeah. And they were really high. There was like a, it was like an octave higher. And it looks like it did nothing to him. Like it was no yeah, effort. Exactly. <laughs> and then he pulls the trumpet yeah. away and he's like. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> his face. Like it's no thing. Like it didn't all. affect him It's like him he just whatsoever. said a sentence. Yeah. yeah. No, right, yeah. <laughs> If I try that, you have to put a chair behind me, and I won't even get it. You're lying. Yeah, you <laughs> are lying because I've uh, yeah, we've yeah. seen you. But yeah, but Freddie Hubbard, I just I was I wait for Freddie Hubbard. I, I've seen this movie mm-hmm. twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I remember those. I, I watched it about twenty years ago, and this the second time I saw it was three days ago, and I just kept waiting. Like, when is the part with Freddie Hubbard? <laughs> I'm just waiting for Freddie yeah. Hubbard, and I know that most almost all of the 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 music shots we were listening to the shot that we were seeing mm. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay because there you go. And the reason i think so is because i mean first of all the all the fingerings are absolutely that's nailed. the thing 
Yeah, yeah. They're absolutely right. They're absolutely nailed. And you can see the trumpet, all three fingers, right? Mm-hmm. But you can't see all mm-hmm. the fingers on the saxophone. Mm-hmm. But, so, but the trumpet stuff is what we're hearing. Mm-hmm. We're seeing what we're hearing. And my second reason for believing that it's authentic and not you know an alternate audio take mm-hmm. is that he's playing very stylistically. So it, it, it's hard to ask a jazz musician to play exactly the same way as you oh, did before. Yeah. 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 They might be able to do it, but I, but I really doubt it. I really doubt yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And they did, like you said, they did a lot of uh, a lot of one takes. I mean, a, a lot of yeah. oneers, a lot of um, yeah. long takes. Um, you know where else I really noticed it too, and it was a great scene, was at the party. Do you remember the scene oh, at the party? Yeah. And I, I was watching the, the drummer yeah. mm-hmm. playing with brushes, mm-hmm. and there's just no way that somebody could mime that. Nobody could like. That can't be someone miming to a recorded take. And you hear the room sound, you know. Who was that singer? Buttercup. Yeah. Was that yeah, Buttercup Butter- or was that somebody else? Yeah. It was Buttercup. Cece, what did you think of the vocalists? Oh my gosh, she this? they were both amazing, but the I woman, know. the Buttercup woman, uh, she had this timbre, like, especially towards the end, it was like this the deepest sound. <laughs> it was like coming out of a a barrel or something. Yeah. It was so deep and it was so rich yeah. and lush. Mm-hmm. I was like, and that it looked like a party. That I was would a party. Definitely want to go see to. see that scene mm-hmm. plus the the scenes in the club. Mm-hmm. But that scene is like, oh my god, I want to be there. Mm-hmm. I want to be yeah. in 1959 in Paris, hanging out at a party just like that French dude, you know, and he's yeah. there like mm-hmm. shooting video and stuff. Yeah. That was they're really not cool. actors, you know. They're musicians actually having fun. Right, like yeah. they would in that in a party, and mm-hmm. you, know, you can hear you know, Herbie Hancock's at that little upright piano and pitching in. And she's just singing along, singing this blues number. Right, it's mm-hmm. a funny little number, and the other guys are kind of coming up to her and you know doing the the shtick and everything of mm-hmm. playing along with her. And and yeah. I and I was thinking, why she must have been so frustrated, the character, you know, mm-hmm. sitting in that bar, just being the the nanny, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and just making sure he doesn't disappear. Mm-hmm. Why didn't they let her sing? <laughs> She's obviously mm-hmm. super good. There are so many people like I was that thinking though, the same in thing, the yeah. in the jazz commute like scene, I think. Cuz they don't let they don't let re- they don't really let singers sit in unless they're like dating one of us. <laughs> no, it really is. Yeah. This is a thing. Since I've I've heard this talked about by older really experienced jazz musicians like you know it's like oh if somebody's singing it's probably somebody's girlfriend mm. you know and it doesn't really matter like you know a lot of jazz musicians still think that singers don't belong in the band mm. you know we can sit in sometimes like you know if, like mm. oh you can sit in for a tune if we feel like you know whatever mm-hmm. if you can sing in this key like you know yeah well okay well just the key for you whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but real i feel like just traditional jazz cats don't see singers as musicians. Mm. And so that happens a lot. So like a lot of us just like hang around. Yeah. There's probably people just, ha- there's probably just a, an enormous amount of talent just hanging around the bar, you know? Yeah. But it's usually singers though, because if you're, if you could play, mm-hmm. play, like if you can, you know, mm. then you could sit in and if you can play a gig, then mm-hmm. they'll let you play a gig. You mm-hmm. know, that, that if you're a horn player, they'll let you play a solo, mm-hmm. you know? But also if you're a friend, like if they know you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But if we see somebody walking in with their instrument, we don't know them. We're, th- we're all up on stage. We're all, all thinking, don't you dare open that case. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah I've, 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 so I've been around that. You just stay there. Energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's invitation only, I've, buddy. I've definitely been around that energy. Yeah. yeah. And, and for good reason, because they might suck. Totally ruined the that's, gig. That's yeah. always the thing, isn't it? You see somebody walk into a bar with an instrument and you're like, for me, I always think, you, you can kind of tell by the way they carry themselves in, in a way, yeah. If they're going to be good or not, it's a strange thing that happens. I'm I'm trying to think. Can I tell? And I want to say that I can. I think in most circumstances, I can totally tell. Yeah. What 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 would be a good cue? What would be a good clue? I it's just an the, energy, yeah. like you know this. Like when you see somebody with their instrument, you know if they if they're acquainted with this instrument or not. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I feel like, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like seeing a couple. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you can tell right. how long they've known each other. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 It's like in Genesis, but singers, though, they say that when when Phil Collins was mm-hmm. auditioning, they knew just yeah. by the way he sat down at the kit that he yeah. was totally. going to be good. Yep. 
Movies about music. I think anybody who even has a some familiarity with jazz has this concept in their head of mm. Paris mm. jazz music in the 1950s, right? Mm -hmm. And I've had that in my head. This is the first time I've seen it on mm. film. I kind of think of it less laid back and more energetic mm. of a scene, but that's just my own fantasy, mm -hmm. I think, image of like bebop or something. I'm just bringing this up because this was kind of showing a depiction of this or a, a rendering of this in a film. And I'm wondering what you guys thought of that rendering or if you had any thoughts on that. I had a lot of thoughts about that because um, I lived in Paris mm -hmm. for almost a decade. And I, when I first went to Paris, I was a jazz singer um, in all technicality. I was not making a good li living out off of it. I was not a glamorous, it was not a glamorous situation, but in all technicality, I went there to sing jazz and I did it. The jazz clubs in Paris still look exactly like that. Mm, mm. Like exactly like that. I don't know why they look like that. And it is so stuffy there in there. The sound is never that great. Mm. People, until recently, fairly recently, were smoking inside the clubs, mm -hmm. just like we saw in the movie. But I will say this. There is just an enormous appreciation, for whatever reason, like of music and jazz, like, mm. but jazz in particular. Like a lot of people, it's just like embedded in their cu culture. They go see live music a lot. And I can't say that about, I mean, I lived in Boston, like, you know, like you, usually when you go to a gig in, in, in the States, it's like, you know, you have brunch there too, but there, ha there happens to be jazz music mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you go to dinner and you're going to drinks and, or you're seeing somebody famous, you know, at mm -hmm. the village vang Vanguard or whatever. But in Paris, people just go there and they just sit and listen and stare. This is a thing that they do. Mm-hmm. And that is pretty much, it's still the same. Mm -hmm. That energy is still there. A lot of, they're fascinated by jazz. And I think I told you during the movie, the French never got over the fact that they didn't come up with jazz. I think mm. that they think that it's like, well, why didn't we come up with yeah. <laughs> It is so French yeah. in a lot of ways. There's it's very impressionistic. He even men mentions Debussy. Yeah, yeah he does. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then there was a, a, a scene in the movie that blew my mind Dale Turner was mm -hmm. looking at a catalog of a Monet exhibition. And he was like, Monet is like Ravel and Tad Dameron. You can mm, see yeah. the colors and, you know, and I was like, oh my God, that's so true. I was like, I never thought about it that way, but that is so true. It is very reminiscent of the Impressionist period, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and the French, because of Debussy and like Ravel, I feel like they have, that they like they participated in jazz, mm -hmm. which is kind of true, right? Like, no, that is true. Like, and there's yeah, yeah. there's been situations where art art movements and uh, not that these necessarily overlapped, but that art mm -hmm. art movements and mu music overlapped. And yeah, yeah, and I think that's kind of true. And then they he there he goes into this very succinct but also very informative monologue about the ninths and the, you know yeah yeah the sixth yeah, and the ninth. he ninths. kind of walks us through the the progression yeah, he does mm -hmm. that, that was the, a very development yeah less starting with lester young yeah sixth and the ninths and then there's the eleventh and the thirteenths and i feel like these distinctions are really important the flat fifth yeah the the major seven yeah monk and stuff yeah so yeah i think that was i i feel like that was probably a very accurate depiction of the jazz. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. What did you think, Gordon, of, of that idea of the of Paris and the jazz scene? Well, I know that for a lot of jazz musicians after the war, you know, after the, the big band thing kind of died down, or even during the big band thing, a lot of musicians were attracted to Europe. And a lot of them did mm -hmm. spend time in Europe, even Louis Armstrong and even Miles Davis and the big bands toured there and they were treated like kings. You know, there wasn't that same kind of, mm. there wasn't that racial sneering going on, the separation that they experienced in the States. Right. And so a lot of them kind of like, forget this. Let's see, you know, I hear that they love jazz in Europe and Paris, especially. And so they found a haven there for a while. Mm -hmm. So I can see why. I mean, it's a, it's a movie about expats too, I thought, yeah. you know. Expat James Baldwin too, I think, uh, went to Paris in order to kind mm -hmm. of get away from being an American. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So writers went there too. Oh, totally. This um, is one of my fantasies is like, I think of all these kind of eras that I would like to live in, like 
I don't know, Hong Kong in the 1920s, Paris in the 1950s, Berlin in the 1980s, you know, San Francisco in the 1960s kind of <laughs> kind of stuff. But that's one of them, you know, Paris in the 1950s. And there's that, I, I've, I've never been to Paris, but I don't know, maybe this is a cliche, you know, Cece, you know more than I do. You know, Paris is kind of known for this cafe culture. Is oh that, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. Like that, the kind of, and also an acceptance of art as a way of life, mm-hmm. you know. And art, yeah, artists are. I, I'm guessing it seems like artists are more respected and kind of revered mm-hmm. in Europe uh, more than say in the states. Honestly, I didn't you know? realize that they were respected and more revered in Europe, mm. or particularly in France, until oh. I came back to Korea, and I was like, okay. <laughs> by comparison, yeah, by comparison, <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess, yeah, people do respect art, and it's embedded in the in everybody's lot mm-hmm. in everyday life. You know, it's um, here. I feel like, and I, I don't have any problem saying this. You can come fight me. You know, I'll give you my phone number if you have something to say about this. But this is a very <laughs> profit-driven society. Like, it's just like, you know. Korea. Oh, yeah. A technology profit, generate profit until you die kind of country. Jazz in the metaverse. It's coming. Yes. And so the art kind of reflects that too, I feel like. There's good art here. But, you know, it, everything is seen from that kind of profit-driven lens. And in France. Right there definitely is a purity that they value in art. I yeah, just, I can imagine uh, someone living in Paris I, and being an artist and that's what you do. It might not, it wouldn't be the easiest life, but at least you could, what do you do? I'm an artist and people would just say, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that there's but yeah. in that. other places, it's kind of like the question artists and musicians get, if you tell them you're a, painter or a filmmaker or something that their first question is what would i have seen of yours Mm. yeah yeah which i hate i hate that Mm -hmm. question Mm -hmm. because it it completely betrays this attitude of oh you're only legitimate if you're making yeah if you're famous or rich and famous Mm -hmm. at it you know which is not universal right not every culture feels this way about artists and you can be an artist and people can accept that in some cultures but rather than more than others and i feel like that it kind of it's related to how this the culture views money yeah i was thinking because the french don't really talk about money like i know you know this i can say with confidence they it, there's still a little bit of it's a little vulgar to bring up like you know how much you know that kind of thing like the cost of things mm-hmm. and like it's it's very vulgar it's considered very 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 vulgar to act like you're rich you know to display and so they value things that don't generate profit like if you're an artist and your pursuits are pure mm-hmm. there's a respect embedded in the culture towards mm-hmm. that pursuit right. and it doesn't matter if you're making money or not there is an inherent respect towards okay. that. I'm, uh, I'm moving there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would do very well. Yeah, there. you would do yeah. well. Okay. I would love that. Yeah, I yeah. think in Korea, there's there's definitely a kind of a feeling of people comparing themselves to others in terms of their success, their level of success. But it's not even, I don't even know what the success that you, what financial success, success. Is because it really is like they treat it as like purely financial right. or purely you know like numbers right mm-hmm. because like what have you done that i have seen now i can answer that question and most people would understand what i do but it doesn't mean that i don't see myself as a successful artist mm-hmm. if anything that i is meant like, financial success yeah yeah because there's there's a lot of like yeah. if you're not working towards upward mobility then what are you doing? Yeah, there's definitely that. Yeah. And there's definitely like a prestige kind of thing. Like how many people watched your music, you know, your yeah. YouTube video. Right. I, I also got that attitude when I was living in Chicago. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. That kind of thing. Like if, yeah. It, like there's this, when you're, when you're choosing a career, it seemed like the crucial question is, you know, what, what are your goals? You know, like what, what do you want to hit? I mean, everybody has goals, but mm-hmm. it's the whole thing of, Making yeah, it, I know what you mean. You know, yeah, making if it, you're not yeah. doing it with the attention of making it, then there's no point in doing it. Mm. And I don't agree with that. At yeah, all. me neither. I think we, we should be able to do what we want to do. What is the Paris of the 1950s today? Does it exist? I would say it's a collapsed economy. Like, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of energy in Athens, apparently. Like, I've heard this 
many times. Well, I think this yeah. is Berlin too. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I think it's a lot of that situation, you know. Lots of young people. Lots of people out of work yeah. mm -hmm. without cell phones. Yes. Lots of young people trying to, you know, just create things and have fun. Right. Gordon, I wanted to ask you, um, like, what's your impressions in terms of either audience or with players performing jazz? Because you've been performing jazz for a really long time in Korea, like going back to, when did you arrive in Korea? Uh, 2001. Yeah, that's going way back. And oh, it wow. started. And you, yeah. 20 years. Yep. Yeah. And within, and I brought my horn with me mm -hmm. and within a couple months, I found a, a couple jazz places, you know, they had live jazz. So I started hanging out there and it wasn't long before, you know, people were talking to me and I, you know, they said, what do you do? I'm English teacher here. And I said, I'm also, I play the trumpet. And the minute I mentioned that the musicians kind of gathered around and said, Oh, bring your trumpet next time, bring your trumpet. So I did. And I really was, I've been playing ever since. Uh, mm -hmm. I found that in Busan, I don't know how it is in other cities, but, uh, or up in Seoul, but, uh, the 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 people that I met in that first year are still my friends. They're still, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, and really just love the music and love, and we just have that in common. And we and they're all still playing, most of them. And it just it was such a wonderful community to walk into, and that was one of the big reasons why you know, I stuck around. Mm. Yeah, and you played with I I, I got here in two thousand seven, and you were you played with some really good players, yeah, like really. really High level jazz you were playing. Mm -hmm. Some really talented, really talented cats here. Yeah. 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 There are a lot of talented people. Yeah. yeah. And good friends. One thing I was thinking about uh, that stuck with me is he had some great lines. Like there was there was a little bit of you know kind of life philosophy going on mm. with some of the lines that he would say. You know, there's not enough kindness in the world. That was it. That was, when, that was one good. of the last yeah. ones. Yeah. Is that the right pace? Yeah. 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 Long pause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. He said that at the, I don't know, what was it? The Brooklyn Bridge? He, he yeah. called everybody lady. Even, you know, the guys. Yeah. yeah. that I didn't know what was up with that. Lady Ace, are you ready to play? Lady Francis. <laughs> lady Francis. I almost saw this movie, and this is going to sound really weird, but I almost saw it as a love story. Oh, definitely. It was like a yeah. bromance. Bro bromance. Yeah. 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 But there are, you know how like there's definitely a bromancy element to how other men view musicians. I don't know if you know what I mean, but like. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing. <laughs> he said it at the restaurant with his yes. separated wife. Mm -hmm. He said, he inspires me. Mm -hmm. And she said, don't I inspire you? Mm -hmm. Right. There's an intimacy, mm -hmm. you know, and you know this, you're a musician. There's an intimacy with music yeah. that you can't have with somebody who doesn't understand music. Yeah, but I feel like men take it really far. Like, I, <laughs> you know, I feel this way about a lot of female <laughs> musicians, right? But I feel like when men get really into, like, certain musicians, they take it really far as in, like, and this guy did too. Like, he invited him to live in his house, right? I think you're mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree. There is a like a, a next level type of bromance between musicians yeah. and music fans, especially music fans. They tend to, I oh, don't know, yeah. there's sort of, I don't know if it's a wolf pack thing. I was in this music fraternity in college mm -hmm. and the thing we had in common was we were all music nerds. And all we did was sit around and talk about musicians and mostly Same, jazz musicians right. and also classical musicians. Mm -hmm. We were talking about who's the principal horn player of the Berlin Philharmonic. They were, these were our mm -hmm. heroes, you know. We would sit around and it was like kids with baseball cards. Yeah. It's funny because it's such a personal, subjective experience. Mm -hmm. And it is, there's, there's something to, I mean, philosophers have written about this, that there is something to the idea of music and a connection to the idea of falling in love because there's no music is non-referential there's no object you're trying to get to there's no thing you're trying to understand in the sense of what it is or what a note is there's no object of a note you know it's just something that you have to take as the experience itself and then you can make something of that you can make meaning of that but it it kind of defies any need to rationalize or analyze even though you can turn on your analytic mind there's just something to it that kind of evades that kind of like <laughs> the idea of dreams is you is you dream so that you can 
release your mind's need to rationalize what you do every day. Music is kind of the same thing. It's a, it's a dreamlike state in the sense that you don't have to, there's nothing to rationalize in the process of doing it. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like, I don't know, a Zen-like kind of experience of just experiencing beauty. And so you can see that intimacy. And then when you meet other people who are like really into it, it's like, oh my God. But then you talk at this kind of surface level thing. You know, you don't talk about the yeah, beauty of right. music, but you, <laughs> but you talk mm-hmm. about your tribes that you like, you know. But you're right, yeah. I did experience this when I was at a vocal (laughs) workshop, (laughs) like a vocal jazz workshop. And it was like mostly women. It was, I think it Mm -hmm. was all women. It was back in 2007 or something. And we would spend like all day and all evening and all night talking about different singers. Yeah. Like drinking wine. See, there you go. Yeah. So I guess I didn't really have enough friends like that, but (laughs) yeah, this, I have experienced this. Oh, we it's could true, really though. dig into this to see what's going on here because it's, it really is a fascinating subject. Yeah. I mean, the thing with, I guess with music, it, to appreciate something, there's it, it kind of blows past, it skips over the kind of measurements of why, mm. why something mm-hmm. is good. It's like there's no, in music, there's no home run record, you know, to beat. Right. Or oh, yeah. number right. of points made during a game, that kind of thing. It's a, to kind of contrast it with sports, but it kind of blows past the normal things that we measure for mm-hmm. greatness. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of, totally. and it's taste, a lot of it is taste. But mm-hmm. when you meet someone who completely gets John Coltrane and you do too, you know, you're, you're kind of finding yourself together on the same cloud that mm-hmm. it's hard mm-hmm. to describe, but you both got there somehow. You, mm-hmm. bo- you both yep. made that leap and surrender to his music to a point where Mm -hmm. you both kind of get it. And that's a, that's, that's a bond. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did we ever see him actually drink? Did the, do we actually see the beverage hit his mouth ever? Mm. I feel like we have, yeah, yeah, I feel like we haven't, but I loved how they did it. I love how they skipped over. I, I hate movies about addiction and you know, somebody with a downward spiral kind of life. I, I don't like them because they're really, it's really depressing. And but, yeah, um, I agree. but this movie, it, it just skipped over those bits. It, it would be him saying, "Hey, buddy, you got five bucks," and then it cuts to the hospital. You know. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. It's I appreciate. I that. like films that. Yeah, I like films that do this. It's where you can show something. Well, the old saying in script writing is you can show something or you can tell something. Tell it, right, but then yeah. you, you, it also, what cinema does is it makes associations be t- between things. And so this film had that kind of slow movement where you had to build the association in your mind. Oh, he's right. he's got a problem. Because it, it wasn't yeah. like the clear right. cliche. Also, this way, it isn't a movie about his addiction, but it's more True. about a movie about the music mm-hmm. and the musician. Well, they didn't push the they didn't push yeah. the high drama. They didn't over dramatize right. the addiction. The aspect. addiction aspect, yeah, yeah. It's like true. that Ray Charles movie. A Ray? lot of that, yeah, Ray. Yeah, was a lot of that movie was about addiction. Oh, remember. so many of these movies. Yeah. Um, Walk the line. Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Yeah, yeah, that was one of those too, right? Right. Earlier, we were talking about um, what was going on in the fifties in the because it, it's mm. yes. fifty nine or something like that. That's supposed to take yes. place yes. in fifty nine. Cool had already happened. Okay, so mm-hmm. Bebop was already mm-hmm. the last genre that Cool mm-hmm, kind mm-hmm. of yeah. was trying to erase. So Miles mm-hmm. had already happened. Mm-hmm. Right? Is that right? 59 was yeah, yeah. Chet Baker yeah. and you mm-hmm. know Jerry Mulligan and that, the West Coast. Mm-hmm. Wasn't that right? 1959-ish? Yeah, I, I would say yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of returned to this to the ballads, the slow stuff and the mm-hmm. smooth the romantic sound. Mm-hmm. As a kind and of depressurization last, reaction right, right. from the bebop, from the Baroque yeah. bebop. Right. Mm. I also learned, um, like, vaguely, for, I remember from jazz history, that I, it was very interesting. So that was going, like, that That was, like, more like an East Coast phenomenon. And from the 60s, there was an avant-garde, like, Ornett Coleman jazz, th- a thing going on in, in California. So California had this whole Frank Zappa and, like, but also... Is that an like, L.A. thing? Yeah, LA, but totally. also you also had experimental free, music and avant-garde yeah, music going free on. Free jazz, time. I think, from like 
mostly LA, but also Northern California. And I so so I think sometimes when Jim York talks too. about yeah, but when Jim talks about music, it's like a very California centric music history centric uh, yeah history that I am not familiar with. So it's very interesting talking to Jim about certain eras. You know, it might have been different in different places. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm starting terms to think. Get, terms get mm-hmm. applied the way people want to apply them, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you are doing this, but I think if you say, mm-hmm. if you throw a term around in New Orleans, they're going to take it one way and then New York is going mm-hmm. to hear it yeah. another way. Because I know that the Chet Baker thing they were calling the West Coast sound and it was a reaction against... Uh, oh, know, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's right. The, yeah. Because they were alienating the audience. Yeah. Beboppers were alienating the audience. It was too fast. It was too mm-hmm. too much. A lot of white people in the West Coast. I think. Ah, yeah. Right? So here we go. Chet Baker and that's right. yeah. Jerry Mulligan. Um, and yeah. The, and the, who's? Yeah. Um, Brubeck. Brubeck, that's oh, who Brubeck, I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. Paul Brubeck Desmond. is very white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he was very much an integrationist. To in spirit mm-hmm. like after the yeah. war because mm-hmm. he's he was oh, an yeah, old timer totally. by then. Did you see that Ken Burns jazz series? Yeah. Yes, yes. There's this re- where he breaks down and cries on camera when he's telling mm-hmm. the story about his uh, one of his jazz compadres who couldn't get into a gig because he was black. Oh, you know? yeah, and just yeah, and yeah. Dave Brubeck telling the story and just breaking down. It was really just mm-hmm. heart heart melting. Mm-hmm. He was yeah. really a humanitarian, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there was a lot of, you know, it brought a lot of, I think it brought a lot of white people into jazz, the the, mm-hmm. the cool thing. Yeah, for sure. Thing. Yeah. And Miles yeah. was in on it too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool sound. Well, that's the cool. nice thing about jazz is it is, you know, we see it in athletics, I think, to some degree is, you know, it's there's a, there's a bond that forms and there's a togetherness that forms that transcends race. In a, in a certain sense, without eliminating what, you know, the differences. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to talk about jazz, especially, you know, the 50s and before the, I mean, the, the civil rights movement wasn't even, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. rolling by then. And so they, they really had trouble. So moving to the things that Louis Armstrong said about being in Europe and being treated like a king and just mm-hmm. it's shocking. Yeah, yeah. Weren't. right. The treatment was so different. Mm-hmm. But you can't talk about jazz without talking about race. It's, it's, yeah, you can't. It's baked it's into true. it. True. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it was born out of slavery. You know. Yep. Yeah, it's. I mean, jazz is black music. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I kind of worried about this movie uh, when it first started, and we were going to see this white French dude as almost the chronicler of events. You know, the the person through whom we see somebody else. Mm-hmm. I was worried that that was going to happen. It didn't really happen. I like the white like. savior. Is yeah, that, yeah, kind of, movies? kind of the the white. Yeah, maybe not so much the white savior, but the white, in a sense, I guess, but the white chronicalist, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, I was kind of concerned about that. And they, it didn't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, there was no kind of reflection at the end by a white person about this right, right. musician. Yeah, and I was so glad they didn't do that. Because he had his own story arc. He was trying to find exactly. his own life. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of these parallel stories coming together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, in that sense, it was very well done. Yeah. 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 It and it it ages well yeah. for that reason I think. <laughs> cool. Cool. I want to tease the next show we're going to do, and Gordon's yeah. going to like oh. this. Yeah. We are going to do because it's the fortieth anniversary of the movie. Okay. Pink Floyd, The Wall. Oh yeah, that's right. Forty. <gasps> yeah. So we're going to do Pink Floyd, The Wall, which Cece has never seen, mm-hmm. oh, and my. which I've seen probably twenty five times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're my favorite band. Yeah. I wore out my VCR of, or my VHS. Yeah, me too. That yeah. It's, so that'll it's be hot. interesting. It's, yeah. It's hard to watch. It's hard to watch. It's it's not a joy to watch. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. We're going to have to upgrade our speakers for that one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to get some new speakers soon. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know this. Let's just yeah, talk about it now and get it over with. Okay. Let's, let's what do you think of Pink Floyd the Wall? What do you think of Pink Floyd the Wall? Let's start it and just keep rolling. <laughs> Let's watch it. Just kidding. <laughs> Maybe you guys could do this. It's about Nazism. No. Oh. <laughs> no, part of the joy, Cece, oh, okay. is you seeing it. Yeah, okay. So what's your what's your one sentence take on Pink Floyd the Wall? Music can really mess you up. Or fame can really mess you up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Those guys are definitely Music can mad. drive you oh, insane. Right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. It's about it's yeah. about I think it's about mental health. Yeah, it's Ooh. it's a lot about mental health. Um 
probably going to be cathartic for me. Yeah, I think you'll like it. Yeah, it's very intense and it's very okay. full of symbolism. Yes, okay. it's a it's a yep. dense, dense symbolic film okay. about madness and fascism. Okay, well, <laughs> and childhood trauma. It's got a it's it's really interestingly made. I know that it's got a lot of it is Alan Parker, and he was in misery. Stuff. He was mm. in total misery making that film, as oh, was God. Bob Geldof, who stars in the film. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, Gordon, thank you so much for being here. Well, yes, what an honor, me. Gordon. Yeah. Can you tell us your Bandcamp page so so that we can direct people there? Yes, it is gordonbazali.bandcamp.com. There you go. Fantastic music. I am a fan thank and you. a follower. Yeah. So am I. I know you mm-hmm. are. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> All right, Gordon. Thanks so much. And thanks uh, a lot, guys. Yeah, we'll see you um yes. on stage or somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hopefully yeah. soon. All right. Yeah. Under the moonlight I'll sing you a song. So you'd magically feel a love that's alone. Hopefully. We paint ourselves all bright with stories of heroes and poets and sadness and war, of immeasurable pain, unconditional love, movies of the